Yesterday's prophecies, today's headlines. This is the Hal Lindsey Report. And now, Hal Lindsey. Good evening. Welcome to this edition of the Hal Lindsey Report. People sometimes wonder why I bother to talk about the dangers of Islam. Why not just present the positive aspects of the gospel? They forget that Jesus himself warned of dangerous belief system, and he called them by name, from the Pharisees to the Nicolaitans. As a Christian minister, it is my mission to show that the gospel of Christ is not just another religion. It is the very truth of God. Sometimes that can be best accomplished by revealing the shabbiness of purely human or demonic belief systems that claim to compete with the gospel. Finally, I stand as a watchman on the wall. God has charged me to give a message of warning when I see danger on the horizon. Islam is one of the truly great dangers facing the world today. Dr. Peter Hammond is a South African missionary. He served in Mozambique, Angola, and the Sudan. He's seen firsthand the tragedy caused by the Muslim faith. By necessity, he became an expert on the subject. He writes, the ultimate goal of Islam is not to convert the world, but to establish Sharia law over the entire world. It's critical that we understand that. Islam is not intent on converting us so much as it is intent on ruling us. Abu Allah Madudi is a famous Islamic scholar and imam. He said, Islam wishes to destroy all states and governments anywhere on the face of the earth which are opposed to the ideology and program of Islam regardless of the country or the nation which rules it. The purpose of Islam is to set up a state on the basis of its own ideology and program. In his book, Slavery, Terrorism, and Islam, Dr. Hammond wrote, the primary aim of Islam is not spiritual, but political. He lays out a summary of how Muslim populations have historically behaved when entering a country as immigrants or refugees. It's a process he calls Islamization. At 1% of any given country, they will be regarded as a peace-loving minority and not as a threat to anyone. At 2 to 3%, they began to proselytize from other ethnic minorities and disaffected groups with major recruiting from the jails and among street gangs. From 5% on, they exercise an inordinate influence in proportion to their percentage of the population. They will work to get the ruling government to allow them to rule themselves under Sharia law. From there, it gets worse fast. When Muslims reach 10% of the population, they will increase lawlessness as a means of complaint about their conditions. Any non-Muslim action that offends Islam will result in uprisings and threats. After reaching 20%, Expect hair-trigger rioting, jihad militia formations, parodic killings, and church and synagogue burning. At 40%, you will find widespread massacres, chronic terror attacks, and ongoing militia warfare. Then, with only 60% of the population, Islam fully rules. From 60%, you may expect unfettered persecution of non-believers and other religions, parodic ethnic cleansing or genocide, use of Sharia law as a weapon, and jizya, the tax placed on infidels. After 80%, expect state-run ethnic cleansing and genocide. Writing for the Gatestone Institute, Ingrid Karlquist recently said of her native Sweden, it may have finally begun to dawn on the people that Swedish Sweden will soon be lost forever and in many areas replaced by a Middle Eastern state of affairs. No one, however, seems to have asked the crucial question upon which Sweden's 
future depends. Is Islam compatible with democracy? If the answer to that question is yes, then where are such nations? Carlquist says, there is no country where Islam is dominant that can be considered a democracy with freedom of speech and equal justice under law. Some point to Malaysia, Indonesia, and Turkey as the shining examples of Muslim democracy. But if a woman in one of those countries is deemed to show too much skin or even too much hair, she can be flogged. It's against the law to even question the Islamic faith, much less criticize it. America's founders believed you could not have a meaningful democracy without freedom of speech. Carlquist writes, politicians, authorities, and journalists all see Islam as just another religion. They seem to have no clue that Islam is also a political ideology, a justice system, or Sharia, and a specific culture that has ruled for virtually everything in a person's life. How to dress, who your friends should be, which foot should go first when you enter the bathroom. <laughs> Granted, not all Muslims follow all these rules, but that does not change the fact that Islam aspires to control every aspect of human life, the very definition of a totalitarian ideology. With new asylum houses continually opening across Sweden, traditional Swedes are feeling less and less at home in their own country. They feel increasingly anxious about their physical safety and that of their families. This is happening in different ways across Europe. Folks, immigration that is not followed by assimilation is just another name for invasion. When you support the Hal Lindsey Report with your tax-deductible gift, you're joining me as a watchman on the wall. I've told you many times that I believe God raised up the Hal Lindsey Report to be a voice of warning to the church, the nation, and the world. I've also told you that I can't do this job alone. I need your help. I need your prayer support and your financial support. And praise God, I've received both in generous supply in the past. But we can't stop now. Please stand beside me on the wall as we proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ and warn the world that he's coming soon. To support this program, send your tax-deductible gift to Hal Lindsey Media Ministries, P.O. Box 470-470, Tulsa, Oklahoma 74147. You can also support this ministry online. Visit HalLindsey.com or call 1-888-RAPTURE. The number of people who believe themselves to be transgender in the United States is somewhat less than 0.3%. Not 3%, but 0.3%. So why continue to bring it up? Because with all the media attention paid to this issue, the numbers may grow dramatically in the next few years. Sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy. A phenomenon we have witnessed repeatedly here in America. I am a watchman on the wall, and I'm telling you that this mass confusion over gender and sex is putting the souls of America's children into the shredder. Last year, 11 states sued the federal government over its threat to withhold funding from schools that require students to go to restrooms and locker rooms designated Oklahoma, for their own sex. The states said the Obama administration had conspired to turn workplaces and educational settings across the country into laboratories for a massive social experiment, flouting the democratic process and running roughshod over common sense policies protecting children and basic privacy rights. A school near Chicago tried to accommodate a boy who said he felt like he was a girl. They allowed him to use the girl's locker room, but school officials wanted to put a curtain around his changing area. 
if this same boy went out into the street and flashed these same girls, he would be arrested. But the Obama administration insisted that a privacy curtain would violate his civil rights. Oddly enough, even the atheists and evolutionists who run our government and academic institutions recognize that at its heart, this is a spiritual issue. When you boil it all down, this is their argument. They are saying the child is physically a boy, but spiritually a girl. The hormones, chromosomes, and physical structure of every cell in his body carry the unmistakable markers of a human male. Chuck Colson wrote in his 2005 book, Lies That Go Unchallenged, being transgender, as it is called, is a violation not only of the moral order, but also of the biological order. Physically, there is no question that this is a boy. The science is obvious, so they turn to the spiritual realm and give that as their answer. They say it's a female trapped in a male body. What exactly is it that is trapped? They must be referring to the soul or the spirit. That makes theirs a religious position, and they're imposing this false religion on everyone else. It turns out that nature has a fix for young boys and girls who feel, who feel confused about their gender. It's called puberty. But members of Obama Justice and Education Departments refused to let nature take its own course. They wanted doctors to step in with powerful drugs in an attempt to stave off puberty and keep the child in confusion. Sadly, almost incomprehensibly, they are destroying young lives. Transgender people are committing suicide at record rates. At heart, these people are at war with themselves, and neither drugs nor surgeons' knives can give them peace. Those psychologically wounded people need help. But the first step must be to stop fighting what God made them to be. And God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. That is a spiritual as well as a biological fact. Pushing troubled boys into girls' locker rooms will only make matters worse. There has recently been renewed talk of a possible confederation between Jordan and the Palestinians. Though this union has been discussed before, no details have been given on how they would govern together. A recent poll of Jordan's citizens shows that they believe such a confederation would threaten Jordan's security, destabilize it internally, and dilute the Jordanian identity. That last point is especially interesting. Before 1967, Jordan ruled East Jerusalem and what they called the West Bank. It was not governed by Palestine because there has never been a nation of Palestine. We often hear talk of using pre-1967 borders as a basis for peace settlement. But you need to understand that they mean using Israel's borders, not Palestine's, because Palestine has never existed. Before 1967, Egypt controlled Gaza, and it does not want Gaza back. Jordan controlled the West Bank, and they don't want it back. Syria lost the Golan Heights and wants them back because it gives them high ground in any future attack on Israel. Forty-nine years ago, this weekend, during the Six-Day War in 1967, Israel captured what the UN calls the Occupied Territory. The war began when Israel responded to an Egyptian army mobilizing on the Israeli border. At that point, Israel had to defend itself. So the day before the Arabs were set to invade, Israel moved in on Egypt in a preemptory strike. 
It quickly destroyed the Egyptian air force on the ground. Israel then moved into Gaza, routing the Egyptian forces stationed there. Egyptian President Gamal Nasser tricked Jordan and Syria into attacking Israel from the east and the north. He convinced them that Egypt had defeated Israel's air force, even though the opposite was true. He actually showed Jordan's King Hussein radar images of Israeli planes heading back to Israel from a raid in Egypt. Nasser told him that they were Egyptian planes on an attack mission against Israel. Even after Jordan attacked Israel in Jerusalem, the Israelis tried to convince Jordan not to fight. But King Hussein responded, the die is cast. In his book, The Iron Wall, Israel and the Arab World, historian A.V. Shalim wrote, first, the Israeli government had no intention of capturing the West Bank. On the contrary, it was opposed to it. Second, there was not any provocation on the part of the IDF. Third, the rain was only loosened when a real threat to Jerusalem's security emerged. This is truly how things happened on June 5th, although it is difficult to believe. The end result was something that no one had planned. I disagree with him on that last point. Someone planned for Israel to have all of Jerusalem, just not someone from this world. Hal Lindsey is pleased to present his latest teaching series, God's Outline of History. In this set of 13 audio compact discs, Hal Lindsey will guide you on a scriptural journey from the Garden of Eden to the Millennium and Last Judgment. You will learn how God views events here on earth. You can receive this informative and inspiring series of 13 audio CDs for only $49.99 plus shipping and handling. Order God's Outline of History by writing to Hal Lindsey Media Ministries, P.O. Box 470-470, Tulsa, Oklahoma 74147. You can also order online at hallindsey.com or by phoning toll-free 1-888-RAPTURE. Order God's Outline of History today. Thank you so much for standing with me as a watchman on the wall. I thank God for sending me such loyal partners, and I pray daily that He will reward your faithfulness and protect and prosper you in these very difficult times. Thank you again from the bottom of my heart. Most Christians have some vague concept of the power and authority that belong to Jesus, but they cannot put their finger on just how he got his authority or how it relates to them. I cannot think of another truth that has been more foundational to my whole understanding of God's working in my life than the truth of Christ's victorious defeat of Satan. It's impossible to appreciate your position of victory in Christ until you know how he won his victory over your three great enemies. That is, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Three words summarize Christ's acquisition of authority for himself and us. They are crucified, resurrected, and ascended. If you understand no other concepts of the Bible than these three words, you would know enough to live a victorious Christian life. Crucifixion. When Christ hung on the cross with our sins on him, he was not only bearing our sin and its consequences of death, but we were actually hanging there on the cross with him. This complete union with Christ is the incredible truth Paul wants us to fathom in the sixth chapter of Romans, also in the book of Ephesians. When God poured out his wrath and judgment upon our sins, he not only judged Christ with the guilt of our sins, but he judged us too. When Christ experienced the final sting of sin, which is death, we died too. 
I have often imagined the hysterical joy that must have swept across hell as news of the death of the Son of God spread, not realizing that Christ's death was a final nail in Satan's coffin, he mistakenly cheered the crucifixion. You see, many times in Jesus' life, Satan tried to get Jesus to sin so he would be vulnerable to sin's consequences, that is death. When he saw Jesus assume the sins of mankind and then voluntarily die because of those sins, Satan thought he had finally won in his conflict with God. He had cleverly gotten God's first perfect man, Adam, to sin, and now God's second Adam, Jesus Christ, the perfect one, was also bearing the sin and death. There must have been a wild celebration between Satan and his demon hordes for those three days and nights, a real lost weekend. But then a sobering and deadly hush fell over Satan's forces as these astonished beings observed the greatest display of power ever unleashed from the hand of Almighty God. The Son of God was resurrected from the dead, and so were we. Resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15.55 asks, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The defeat of Satan was sealed. With the resurrection of Jesus, Satan forever lost his authority over the humanity of Jesus and over everyone who claims union with him. Just picture the chagrin that Satan must have had before his rebel followers. Far from being the victor, he became the vanquished. He and his hordes were the captives in the victory train of triumphant Jesus. Colossians chapter 2 verse 15 says, When he, the Father, had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he, the Father, made a public display of them having triumphed over them through him, Jesus Christ. When the Father, through Jesus, stripped Satan and his demons of their authority, that victory was ours. In Satan's mind, not only is Jesus the, his conqueror, but so are those who are in Christ. Satan knows that he has no legal right to any ground in the life of a believer. But if he can keep us from finding out this truth, he will have a field day in our lives. The verse we just looked at says, Jesus disarmed those hostile powers. That's just exactly what it means. Satan is like a toothless bulldog. He can growl and intimidate, but he has no authority to back up his threats in the life of a believer. But if we don't know this or believe it, we will allow him to intimidate us, and he is a master at that. He loves to get Christians to cower or run from him in fear. Satan is a vanquished enemy who must now resort to bluff, threat, intimidation, accusation, and temptation. The believer who does not know and count upon his complete union with the person of Christ in his crucifixion and resurrection is a prime target for these clever attacks of Satan. Ascended with Christ. I said that there are three words that comprise Christ's position of authority over Satan. We've briefly seen what Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection have done to the hosts of hell. The culmination of God's whole redemptive plan was to place Christ on the throne at his right hand forever putting Christ's enemies under his feet. Any enemy of Christ is an enemy of ours, and anyone put under Christ's feet is put under ours also, because we are actually members of his body. How can I say it and make it understood? We are members of his body. We are in Christ. Because of my total identification with Christ in the mind of God, Whatever is true of Christ is true of me. Jesus is now seated on his throne in heaven at the right hand of God, the center of the greatest power and authority in the whole universe. And we 
are seated there with him. He has delegated to us the use of the same authority he has and the power to use it over mutual enemies while we are here on earth. Isn't that fantastic? Listen to what God declares in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 7. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead and our transgressions made us alive together with him are in Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him and seated us with him or in him in the heavenlies, in Christ Jesus, in order that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. God has so completely dealt with me, the sinner, and my sins that he has already seated me in the heavenlies in Christ. While I talk to you from behind the desk here in the great state of Texas, I am at the same time seated with him in the heavenlies. We don't have to wait until we die and go to heaven before this becomes true. It's a reality right now. If you have never personally asked Jesus Christ to come into your heart and forgive all your sins through his shed blood, do it right now. He will, from that moment on, clothe you with his own righteousness. Do it now. That's it for tonight, folks. God willing, I'll see you next week. You've been watching the Hal Lindsey Report. To support this program, send your tax-deductible gift to Hal Lindsey Media Ministries, P.O. Box 470-470, Tulsa, Oklahoma, 74147. You can also support this ministry online. Visit hallindsey.com or call 1-888-RAPTURE.